Turn in your Bibles today, if you will please, to the book of Philippians. It sure is good to see you. Thank you for being in your places today. The book of Philippians, chapter 3. When you find your place, if you will, would you stand as we reverence the Word of God? Philippians, chapter number 3. I begin reading today in verse number 10. The Apostle Paul, as he writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says this, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I want to point out, just before we pray, in verse number 12, a word that has to do with the series of messages I brought through the month of January. And it is, I want you to notice the word perfect in verse number 12. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. Now that does not mean sinlessly perfect. It's not what it means at all. It means mature. I, I want us to understand in today's message once again things that we need to do to close out this year on a spiritual high note in our lives. I want this year to be a better year for us spiritually than last year. I want us to be able to measure our commitment to Christ, our love for Him to a greater degree as we, this year draws to a close than last year. In other words, I'm challenging us to mature more in our faith and to love our Lord more. Yes. And I'm trying to help us this month, this first month of the year, by the way, almost gone. I'm trying to help us this month to put some practical truths in place in our lives that we may love him more and we may mature more as Christians in our walk with God. Lord, we love you and we thank you for caring for us. I thank you for the music. I thank you for each one present, our regular members, our visitors who've honored us by being here. I ask you now during these next few moments through the presence of the Holy Spirit of God, that you will come in a powerful, special way and speak to each heart. And during the invitation today, Lord, draw us, compel us, and constrain us to do what the Spirit of God would speak to us about and that which needs to be done in our lives. And we'll thank you for it. Because we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you. Many years ago in China, there was a missionary doctor. He had given his life to minister physically 
to those with needs in that country. When they would come to him for his services, not only would he diagnose and treat their physical conditions, but they never left his office without getting a witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he won many of those people to the Lord. He said one day an elderly lady came to him. She was bent over and stoop-shouldered from the years of service. He said, I could tell she had walked a long ways to get there. Her feet were dusty, her clothes dusty. She looked like the plowman of time had pulled the furrows of eternity over her forehead. And he had the privilege of ministering to her physically. After he had diagnosed and ministered to her, he gave her the gospel. She'd never heard the gospel. He told her how Jesus loved her and Jesus died for her and how Jesus would save her. And she said, this sounds like something or someone I need to meet. And so that day, she bowed her head there in his office in tears, he said, began to run down her face. And he said the tears cut their way through the dust, made little channels down her face as she was weeping over her newfound faith in Jesus. She left that day and he, he, he wondered about her the next few days, next weeks, and he said early one morning there came a knock on his office door even before he opened his office. And there stood that same little lady. And she said, uh, sir, I hate to bother you. I don't mean to trouble you. But said, my life has been changed since I came to you recently that person you told me about, uh, that person has, has changed my life. I, I, I'm just totally changed. I, I'm not the way I, I was before I came. Sir, she said, could you tell me again his name? I, I forgot his name. I, I know he's changed my life. But could you please tell me who he is? And the doctor said, sure. Ma'am, his name was Jesus. She said, Jesus? He said, yes, Jesus, Jesus. She said, Jesus, Jesus? He said, yes, ma'am. It was Jesus I told you about, and you prayed, and you invited Jesus to become your Savior. She said, well, thank you, sir, for telling me his name. I, I couldn't remember, but I just know my life got changed. And I thank you for telling me about Jesus. The doctor came back on furlough eventually, and he was telling that story. And an individual heard him tell that story and picked up a pen and wrote these words, and we sing these words occasionally. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. And he's just the same as his lovely name. That's the reason why I love him so. For Jesus is the sweetest name I know. There's no one like him. I've said to us this month, in order to grow, we must study the Scriptures on a daily basis. We must read the Bible. Because the Bible said that we're to desire the sincere milk of the Word that we may grow thereby. The Bible must and needs to be a daily part 
of our lives if we are to grow. The Bible is spiritual food to us like physical food is to our physical body. I have stated this month in order to grow this year, not only do we need Bible, but we need prayer. When we read the Bible, God's talking to us. When we pray, we're talking to him. But we're not talking to a God that cannot hear. We're talking to a living God who knows every time a little sparrow falls out of the sky. He understands. He is a high priest which can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Every day we need to talk to him. You don't have to bow your head. You can talk to him driving down the road. You can talk to him lying in the bed. You can talk to him on the job. You can talk to Jesus. He hears. I talked to us about the different individuals mentioned in the Bible. There's the, the natural person, born naturally in a natural world, doing the things that a lost person would naturally do. And then there is the spiritual person, the person who has trusted Christ like this little lady whose life has been transformed and changed. And then the Bible says there's also the carnal person. The carnal person is the person who in all probability may be saved. But hear me well, they've got over being saved. They've lost their joy. They're not as happy in the Lord as they used to be. Yeah. I come to you today to say this, that spiritual growth increases in our lives as our love for the Lord Jesus Christ increases in our lives. If I ask you today, do you really love Jesus? I'm sure everybody in this auditorium and listening to me would say, sure, I love him. But the question is, what is the depth of your love for him? In our text verse, chapter 3, verse 10 of the book of Philippians, here's what the apostle Paul said, that I may know him. Now that's a very interesting phrase that I may know him. I don't think there's a person listening to my voice today that doesn't know him. But there's probably people listening to my voice today unsaved. Because you can know about him and yet not know him. The world knows about Jesus, but the world is not saved. What Paul is saying here is, that I may know him, that I may know him in an experimental way. In other words, he's saying, I want to know him in such a way that I can testify to those around me that he's real in my life. I can testify about his goodness. I can testify about his completeness in my life, how he brings joy and contentment into my life. I'd ask you today, how precious is Jesus to you? The more we get to know him, the more we should love him. Have you ever been around somebody you thought you really, you know, this person's way up here and the more you're around them, they kind of dwindle a little, little in your estimate. You'll never find that true with Jesus. You'll have to testify that the more you get to know him, the more you love him. He's a friend. He's a companion. He's on board with you. He's not bailing out on you. Do you know him today intimately? And do you know him personally? Uh, is, he, is he a person that you fellowship with every day of your life? Uh, but, but you say, preacher, I can't, I can't see him. That's true. 
but you can experience it. Paul said that I may know him in a more intimate way. I want to fellowship with him. Has there ever been a time in your life when Jesus was more real to you than he is right now? You know, when folks get saved, they want everybody to know they got saved. They'll go home and they'll tell whomever, hey, I got saved. And people, usually they'll rejoice with them. They'll say, congratulations, that's wonderful, praise the Lord. Many people go to work on Monday morning and, and they say, hey, I want to tell you something. I got saved last night or I got saved yesterday at church. And everybody up and down the floor and everybody in the company, they'll say, have you heard about her or have you heard about him? They said they got saved last night. And it broke out on you like the measles. Everywhere you went, you wanted, you wanted people to know that Jesus was precious to you. You wanted to tell people about him. You wanted to tell people about how your life got changed and the joy and the thrill of being saved, how wonderful it was and how wonderful it is that you've come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and all of a sudden it feels like you're walking about 10 feet tall because the load of sin's been lifted. And Jesus has come in and you're justified in the sight of God and you know that your destination is heaven and if something happens to you, you know as Paul said here in the book of Philippians, to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. I've got everything going for me. I'm happy to be saved. I'm glad to know Jesus as my Savior and you want to share it with everybody. Let me ask you a question. What happened? Where's the glory that you used to speak of? Do you still have it? Is he still as real to you in your life now as he was when you first met him? Do you still have that thrill to go to church? Do you still have that thrill to read his Bible? Do you still have that thrill to talk to him? Tragically speaking, a large majority of the people who who, who came to know him as their personal savior, they've had a cooling off period. For whatever reason, he's not as real as he used to be. The zephyrs of heaven are not flooding the soul like they used to. The dew's gone off of the roses. That, that bucket of honey that used to be kicked over in the gable ends of your soul, no longer do you feel what you used to feel. And my question today is, who moved? The Lord's still the same. He hasn't changed. And the only way we can grow this year, the way we ought to grow, is to give him his proper place back in our life, sitting as king in our soul, that Jesus Christ and Jesus only is the one who is the supreme person in our lives. Is he real to you today? Do you enjoy being saved? Or is it an endurement or a burden instead of a blessing? When I read my Bible, I read about those who at one time loved him supremely and then for whatever reason, they, they grew cold on the Lord. In the book of the Revelation, chapter number two, John was writing to the church of Ephesus and, and the Lord was commending them. Hear this well. The Lord was commending them for their works. He was commending them for their labors of love. It was a working church. It was a church that anybody would be thankful for. It was a church that anybody would want to be a part of. It was a, a church, they sing the right songs, they have the right worship, they are busy. But the Lord looked down in the hearts and listen to what he said. I have somewhat against you 
because you have left your first love. The church was busy, but it was mechanical. It wasn't that Jesus was real and, and was the one that was responsible for the things that they were doing. Uh, they were doing it because it's tradition to do it. They're doing it because we've always done it this way. This is the way you do it around here. Uh, they were singing, but Jesus wasn't real. They were worshiping, but Jesus wasn't real. Uh, they're coming to church, but Jesus is not r real in their lives. He said, I have somewhat against you because you have left your first love. In other words, they had gotten over being saved. Is that true of anyone here? Again, can you remember a time in your life when Jesus was more real and more precious to you than he is today? Oh, you ought to get around this altar. Even before this service is over, you ought to say, Lord, I'm sorry you've done so much for me and I find myself doing so little for you. Lord, you went to the cross of Calvary so that my sins could be forgiven. And Lord, I've kind of lapsed in my walk with you and I'm not where I ought to be, I should be. And Lord, I want to acknowledge I'm not what I need to be. Forgive me and help me get back where I ought to be. Have you kind of left your first love? Do you know that's what, that's what happens in marriages? People get over getting married. One of the worst things that can happen is that the man gets <clears throat> more joy out of going out with the boys than he does going home to his wife. Or the wife would rather go to the crochet party and the goose club than to come home to her husband. And that spells tragedy. How many of you understand you don't get married to spend the time with the boys or the girls? You get married because all of a sudden you're walking down the street one day or you're at a place of business and you, you men, you see that lady and you said, I believe that's the one. And your heart skips a couple of beats and you say, who's that gal? I, I don't know, I, but I, you know, we'll find out. Next thing you know, first date out. Next thing you know, I do. And the next thing you know, if you're not careful, boy, I did it. <laughs> that husband ought to be more real to you today than when you said I do. That wife ought to be more real to you today than when you said I do. The more you know about each other, the more you ought to love each other. And when that love begins to grow cold, you've got problems. In your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, when your love for him begins to grow cold, you've got spiritual problems. You say, I, I just don't have the joy I used to have. Jesus can put it back because Jesus brings joy. You say, well, I, I, just, I just don't have the excitement that I, that I used to have. Well, get back to where you can get the excitement. Say, Lord, I'm sorry. I, I haven't lived the way I should. I haven't served you the way I should. I've let my life grow cold. I've let my life go indifferent. I want to give you a verse of Scripture to prove what I'm just saying. You have your Bibles. Would you turn with me, please, for just a moment to the book of Galatians? Just turn back in your Bible just a few chapters to the, to the book of Galatians. I want you to look with me in Galatians chapter number 4. Galatians chapter 4 and verse number 15. The Apostle Paul is writing this letter to the church of Galatia because there's a teaching going on over there that the only way you can be saved is to trust Christ and keep the law of Moses. There was a time when they, Paul preached to them and they, they're excited about being saved. But now something's happened and their, their love for the Lord is growing cold. And it breaks his heart. And look with him in Galatians chapter 4 verse number 15. He says to them, where is then the blessedness you spake of? Here's what he's saying. You used to talk about how wonderful it is to be saved. What happened to that testimony? 
Are there people around you that you used to talk about Jesus around? You, you wanted to share the love that you have for Jesus, but today you find yourself around that crowd and you're talking to everything about, uh, to them about, G, about, about, about Jesus. But here's what happened in the book of Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 7. Notice what he says. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Here's what he's saying. What did you allow to come into your life that was greater than your love for Jesus? Who cut in on you is what he's saying. Now here's what he's doing. He's using an illustration. He's using the illustration of a track meet. The track is marked off. And the man is staying within those lines and he's running. And he's giving it his best. And he's running with his eyes on the finish line. And that's what happens to us when we get saved. We're going forward. We're running with our eyes towards the finish line. Well, what Paul is saying here, who hindered you? That's a phrase that means we're running down this track meet. We're running towards the finish line. And suddenly somebody running beside of us, they cross over that mark. They get in front of us and they trip us up and we fall. That's the, that's the image that Paul's using here. He said, you're running this race for the cause of Jesus. Who hindered you? Who tripped you up? Who crossed the line? Who caused you to stumble? What caused you to stumble? What came into your life that impeded your spiritual progress? May I ask us that today to those of us that may not be as close to the Lord as we used to be and we don't enjoy being saved to the same extent we used to. Who came into your life to influence you more than Jesus Christ? That's the reason it's important that you hang around the right crowd. You hang around the worldly crowd, they will sap your spiritual vigor. You hang around the backslidden crowd, always murmuring and gossiping and complaining, and nothing is ever right. If you hang around with that crowd, I guarantee you, they will take the spiritual vigor out of your spiritual life. What kind of uh, instrument, what happened to you? If it wasn't a person, what in your life caused you to trip up? Was it your job? We get so immersed in our job. We get so immersed in trying to make a living. We forget about the fact we've got to die. We forget about the fact we've got to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got to stand in his presence somewhere, someday out there in eternity. And the, Paul raised the question, who, who cut in on you? What was it in your life that got your eyes off of the Lord Jesus Christ? You know what the tragedy of that is? The tragedy is there are those who recognized us, fellowship with us, when we love the Lord supremely, and they now they don't see that in our lives anymore. They've never been saved. They're looking for someone to live differently. And what are we doing? Well, we're killing the influence of Christ because, well, there they used to be that, and they used to do this, and they used to do that. But look at them now. We should not live so that we give this lost world an excuse for not loving Jesus. Who cut in on you? I'm reminded of David when he committed those atrocious sins in his life. And in that great repentant psalm, in Psalm chapter number 51, when he came back, here's what he said, Lord, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Let me ask you today, is your joy gone? Has your spiritual bucket got a hole in it? I like what the old country fellow said about a man that had made a profession of faith. And a few years later, he wasn't doing so well, and one of his neighbors said his bucket leaked. Is your, bu is your bucket leaking today? Is Jesus real in your life today? Look at our text verse in the book of uh, Philippians. 
he, Paul here, there's so much here. I can't even get out of my introduction, but I'm trying to get down to the message. Pray that I can get there. Look with me in Philippians chapter number three. I want you to notice what he said in verse number 13. Here's what destroys a lot of people spiritually. They get their eyes off of Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind. You know what destroys a lot of people? The devil reminds them of their past. And they live so much in their past that they cannot enjoy the present or the future. Paul said, I want to mature in the Lord, and in order to do so, I've got to get close to the Lord, and I've got to let, I have got to allow the past to go. Let me remind you today, if you're saved, you don't have a past. That's the reason it's important to keep your eyes on Jesus. The moment you trusted Christ as your Savior, I don't care what was back there. I don't care how bad it was. I don't care how many, uh, into what depths of shame and debauchery you found yourself in when Jesus saved you. It was all gone. He kissed it all away. He forgave all of it. He justified you. You stand before the throne of grace as if you had never committed a single sin. Heaven is your destination. And there's nothing in this world that can change that. And many times with people who have a, 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 a terrible past, the devil comes along and he said, yeah, remember what you used to be? Look what you did. Look what you said. Remember how you acted. Remember how depraved you were. Remember all the drugs you took. Remember all the alcohol you drank. Remember all of the filth in your life. The devil will come along and throw all of that up to you. And the first thing you know, you're going forward looking in a rearview mirror. And when you do that, the devil has won the victory in your life. That's the reason it's important that you keep focused on Jesus. And when the devil comes to you and he says to you, remember your past, you just look at the devil and say, you remember your future. <laughs> when the devil comes to you and reminds you of what you did back there, you just remember the Bible said in Romans chapter 8, verse number 1, there is therefore now this very minute no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. That everything that could condemn you has been taken care of at the cross of Jesus. Amen. There's not one single sin charged against you. Amen. Think about that. Every sin charged against you was forgiven the moment you trusted Christ as your Savior. And you stand today clothed, not in your righteousness, but you stand today clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You are accepted in glory today through the merits of Jesus Christ. That's enough to cause you to praise God over. You need to fall in love again with the Lord Jesus. You need to remember how precious Jesus is. You need to get back and, and thank God. Thank God that he saved you. Let me ask you today, what is your desire? Do you have a genuine desire to get closer to the Lord? I love what the psalmist said in Psalm chapter number 42, verses 1 and 2. Listen to this. He said, as the heart paineth after the water brook, so paineth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before him? Here's the story of a deer that's been chased by the dogs. He's almost ready to fall over. But he crosses the road. He goes down a path and suddenly the dogs are off of his trail. He finds a brook of water. He's thirsty. And he's able to get to the water and he's able to get refreshed. The psalmist said, 
I want to be like that deer trying to get to that water brook. I want to thirst after God like that deer thirst after that water. The Bible said, they that hunger and they that thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Do you have a thirst for God? Do you have a hunger for God? What is there today, my friend, that's satisfying your desire? There's nothing today. There are no substitutes. We live in a world of substitutes. I got sugar diabetes. Because I love sugar. And I have to use those substitutes. And after using substitutes for years, I read where the one that I happen to like the best can cause cancer. That's what substitutes will do for you. A lot of people are living on substitute saviors. They brought something else into their life and they've kindly pushed Christ out and they're not happy. Their joy's gone because there's no one, there's nothing that can substitute for Jesus. Why do I like Jesus so much? Well, he's everything. Whatever we need, he's our everything. I heard a story story years ago. In fact, I read this story. I knew the preacher. He was off in a distant state up towards Canada and he was, he was preaching. And the pastor wanted to take him. I think he was going to take him over in Canada. And so they get in their automobile and they've got the day off and he won't have to preach till that night. So he said, I'm going to take you over here and show you something. And they're going down the road and this preacher that's the visiting evangelist looks in front of him and there's a tunnel. He says to the pastor, we're not going through that, are we? He said, that's the only way we can get over there. He said, stop the car. He said, man, I can't stop this car. We're in a flow of traffic. He said, what's the problem? He said, I'm claustrophobic. He said, man, I can't stand that tunnel. He said, stop the car. Let me out. He said, man, if I stop this car in this flow of traffic and let you out, you're, you, you, you probably will get hurt. He said, that's better than going through this and dying. He said, I can't handle this. It's claustrophobic. Well, the pastor said, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to make the best of it. And the pastor reached over and put his hand on his hand. And he said, now we go in this tunnel. It's going to be all right. Just you need to close your eyes or whatever. Don't worry about it. It's going to be all right. He said, man, don't you put your hand on my hand. You hold my hand. And he said, you hold on tight to my hand. And so the pastor holds his hand as tight as he can as they go down in this tunnel and go through it to the other side. When I read that story, I got to thinking, there's another tunnel we're all going to have to go through. You know what? None of us have ever been through it before. It's called the tunnel of death. Every one of us, if the rapture doesn't take place, if Jesus doesn't come in our lifetime, we're going to go through that tunnel. You know what I like about it? Because we have the promise in the Word that when we're facing it, we may, we may be conscious up to the few split seconds before we go into it. We may be on a hospital bed. We may be on a respirator. We may be in our home. We may be in an automobile. But somewhere down the journey of life, all of us, we've got to go through that tunnel. That's right. But you know what's so wonderful about it? When we get there, there's going to be one who, spiritually speaking, is going to grab a hold of us. He's going to take our hand 
And he's going to say, you don't have to worry. I know the way through here. Because I've been through here before. And I've just come back to help you get through this journey. And then he's going to say to us in so many words, you don't have a thing to worry. Everything's going to be all right. I'm going with you. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thank God this Jesus we're talking about that many times we get cold and indifferent uh, and we don't worship him like we should. We don't serve him like we should. We don't love him like we should. Uh, we don't pray like we should. We don't read his word like we should. He still hasn't abandoned us. He still hasn't checked out on us. He's still there. And when we close our eyes in death, my friend, he's going to be there. He's promised to be there. He will be there. And in those darkened moments when we're transitioning, from this world into glory. We're not going through that tunnel alone. We're going through that place uh, with the presence uh, of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. That's enough to make a Presbyterian shout. Amen. Jesus is real. Listen. When you get ready to buy clothes, you want to try to find the best you can for the money you've got. When you get ready to buy an automobile, you want try to try to get the best automobile you can purchase. You get ready to buy a house, you want to buy a nice house if there's any way possible. Some of us some people may be able to buy a better house than you can, a better car than you can, better clothes than you can. Hear me well. Nobody, nobody, nobody can get a better Savior than you've got. And if we are interested in buying the right clothes and the right car and the right house, and getting the right job for our physical life to be more advantageous for us. Why don't we want to serve the best God in the universe on a secondhand basis and treat him as if he's a spare tire? If we want the best clothes, we ought to want the best Savior. If we want the best automobile, we ought to want the best Savior. If we, if we want the best crowd to hang around with, then we ought to align ourselves with Jesus because the crowd uh, that we hang around with is the crowd uh, saved by grace, uh, and it's the same crowd we're going to spend eternity with. Uh, former things are passed away. We're going home to die no more. We're going home to be in his presence forever and forever and forever, and we must not allow the temporal things to push him out of our life. Uh, we're going to need him more in the days to come than we've ever needed him before. He's a present help in the time of trouble. Let's get around the altar. Let's get back to him. Let's get the joy back. Let's get the service back. Let's get the happiness back in our lives by drawing close to him. James said, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Let's stand with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. Paul said that I may know him. How well do you know him today? How much does he mean to you? As you survey your life, can you look back to a time and a place when he was more precious to you? More dear to you than he is today? You say, Pastor, as I, as I look back, I want to be honest, preacher, I hate to have to say it, but I want to be honest. I'm not as close to him as I used to be. I want you to pray for me. God spoke to me today about it. I know I need to draw closer to the Lord. Would you pray for me? Slip your hand up and let me pray for you. I see hands all over the building going up today. Jesus, I pray for these. Lord, help us to be honest about it today. Oh, it hurts us when those who say they love us turn on us. I know it must hurt you when we say we love you 
and yet we live as if we don't. I pray you'll help us during these few moments of invitation to make some concrete decisions just to decide today we're going to draw closer to you. Lord, bless us now, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Quartet's going to sing as they sing. Come on, others need to come. Just be honest and get around the altar today. Say, Lord, I just want to confess I'm not as close to you as I need to be. I want to get around the altar. I want to make it happen today. They're singing. Others need to come. Let's come today while the Spirit of God's speaking to us. Would you come?